You see, entrepreneurs don't just start. You started as kind of a jock sniffer, you know, <laughs> autograph chaser, right? That's okay. I say a that jock. with great respect. Okay. All good. All right, welcome to RenManMusicAndBusiness.com. My name's Steve Rennie. My friends call me Renman, and this little program is called Renman Live. For the last two years, folks, we've been getting together with some of the smartest, most talented people in the music business to talk about today's music business. And you, all you folks watching, are invited to be part of the conversation. On today's show, I'm stoked to say we're going to be talking with two young EDM music biz uh, entrepreneurs, manager and entrepreneur Jake Udell from Chicago, Illinois, and all the way from Miami, Florida, we're going to be talking with a gentleman by the name of Eric Fuller, who's an EDM promoter who uh, works with a company called Life in Color. Um, both of these gentlemen are doing some amazing things in their 20s, and they are living proof that if you dream big and do big, uh, some great things can happen. Um, joining me for the festivities today is my good friend, attorney, and uh, former intern made good. Her name is Audrey Ben Walid. How the heck are you doing, Audrey? I'm good. How good are to you? see you again. Good to see you know, you. we love having Audrey here because it definitely takes up the fashion quota a notch or two. Um, and I'm very conscious of the fact that I have no fashion sense. How has it been going for you, Audrey? Very good. Very busy and, you know, meeting new people every day. Awesome. Audrey, by the way, folks, is a networking animal. And so she, this is the only time I see her now is when I, if I keep booking good guests, I, I, I hear from Audrey and she comes in here. So Audrey's going to be helping me out today. Uh, helping you folks get involved by manning the chat rooms and making sure we have some great questions and so forth, right? Um, we got a saying around here at the uh, World Headquarters. What is it, Audrey? You don't ask, you don't get. You don't ask, you don't get, okay? <laughs> and you don't learn anything, folks. So if you're looking to learn something about the music business, I'll tell you how it happens. You ask questions, you hang out with smart people, and that should help you learn some stuff. So if you can't get that right, I'm not sure about your prospects in the music business. Audrey, tell the folks how they can uh, handle those questions. Sure thing. For you early bird or you early planners, you go to renmanmb.com and you can post your questions directly on the event site. You can still do that now because I'm going to be looking at the questions. And refreshing frequently. And refreshing frequently. You can also be on the YouTube live stream in the chat room and I will be looking at those questions as well. And if you're really brave, you can call in. What's that number? 310-469-9067. And if you call in, what do you get, Renny? Hey, you see this fine t-shirt here, folks? There, oh, look, look at that. At that oh, 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 let me move over here. Fuck the gatekeepers. That's <laughs> right. Some old 70s porn star on there, I guess. Yeah, who made that shirt? Who made that shirt? <laughs> Whose idea was that? That was Cody Romnus's idea. Yeah. Yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. You can win this shirt or a mug. Uh, we also have uh, mouse pads. We get, like I said, it's a virtual gift shop here. It's like going to freaking the Disneyland of rock. Um, all right, that's good stuff. Okay, let's dive right into it because we got a good one. Um, first, I want to tell a little story. Um, we talk about this idea of how you learn the music business. And the way you learn the music business is by hanging out with smart people. So we provide you a great way to do that here at Red Man Live, where we're talking with some of the smartest folks around. We're going to talk to two more here today. Um, but today's show is actually a great example of networking and what it takes to go make friends in this business. Um, Identifying who you're going to need in this business to help you, because if you're going to do something big, you're going to need some help. Identifying those folks and connecting with them is crucial. So I say it all the time, if you want to get ahead, you need to be out there shaking hands and meeting people. Um, I met our first guest here today. Uh, for the, uh, from a friend of mine, a guy by the name of Neil Jacobson, and for you folks that don't know, is one of the top A&R guys in the business. Do we have a picture of Jake here? We got him here somewhere. He's a handsome guy. I like to show him here. Uh, he, he, he likes it to be shown as well. Anyway, Neil Jacobs, a big top A&R guy at Universal Music, uh, called me up one day and said, hey, Ren, there's this young guy who's doing some uh, promoter like you were in the early days that's doing some great stuff. He's got this company called Life in Color. I want you to meet him. And his name was Eric Fuller. Um, so today we're going to have be get, getting Eric into the program here with us. So let me give you a little intro on him. Um, Eric, it turns out, got his start back in college uh, putting on parties. And uh, the parties have just gotten bigger. The parties moved from college around the world. He's doing some amazing things. Today, he's a top exec with EDM promoter Life and Color, who are now part of the SFX organization. Uh, do we have him on Skype there, Cud? 
We do. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome my good friend, Mr. Eric Fuller. Whoa, how the heck are you, my friend? Hey, Steve. How's it going? Good. How's the weather down there in Miami? Uh... Partly cloudy today, but it's hot and humid like always. Perfect. Hey, Coach, show me that uh, real quick, that picture we had, the bio shot. There he is, Eric Fuller. Now, that's a great-looking shot. I know his mom's very proud of that, but when I see that picture, I'm not thinking EDM promoted. Eric, first off, let me say thanks for joining us on the show here today. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I want to add, there you are, you're back again, you handsome. Much better outfit today, Mr. Fuller. Hey, I, le I left the collar at home for you this time, Steve. And you guys are really taking that life and color thing to a new level with the office uh, paint job. I love that. Yeah, we, we, we keep it real over here. We got orange walls and, and paint everywhere. All right, good. Hey, Eric, I want to ask you the same question that I ask everybody. One of the toughest things to do in the music business is to get started. Lots of people dream and not as many people doing. You didn't seem to have a lot of trouble getting started in the business. Give us a brief you know, overview of how you got started in the business when, from when you moved from dreaming about doing something in the music business to actually doing it. Well, yeah, it's, um, it's actually a, a really cool story. Um, started doing parties in college, and they just kind of grew and grew and got bigger. Um, I was doing a paint party uh, at my alma mater at UNF, um, which is how I met Sebastian Solano and Played around down the road, Patrick, Lucas, and Paul. Um, so I started doing my own paint party, and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And um, you know, simultaneously, these guys were doing their event, Deglo. And you know, I had met them in college, and we just kind of all intersected at some point. And eventually, I, I joined up with those guys, uh, took a position. We started a, a couple other companies as well, and um, just kind of all happened. You know, and it happened really fast. Okay, I got a question, but I have to ask this. Now, I started as a concert promoter like yourself. Um, the, the closest thing we ever got to anybody spraying paint on somebody, I recall we were doing a Billy Idol show at the Hollywood Palladium where somebody thought it'd be a fun idea to take a fire extinguisher off a wall and spray the crowd. Um, I'm not sure they'd enjoyed it as much as some of the folks that are going to your show. Who came up with this idea of, hey, let's throw a concert and we'll spray paint on everybody? Well, it actually started uh, at, with a fraternity in Tallahassee at Florida State. Uh, it was a private event, and, you know, it would be like, you know, a couple hundred guys and then just a, a bunch of chicks and paint, pretty much. Um, so it, 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 it started that way, and then the concept just, you know, grew outside of that. And it, uh, like I said, it just got, got bigger and bigger. But, you know, it's crazy, and it's funny you say that. Um, uh, the, the paint concept is is something that is just like, when you go to our event, it, everyone's expecting it and they're gonna get it. I mean, we have hundreds of gallons of paint that, that go out each night. So yeah, the, the crowd often, with, within 10 minutes, they're gonna be chanting, you know, we want paint and it goes, goes all night. All right, let me ask you another question. I got my promoter hat on. Usually, you know, if you're a promoter, for you folks that aren't familiar, promoter will go out and rent a building, uh, typically, and, and, and that sometimes that's easier to do than others. When you are pitching venues on being a part of your event, and you tell them you're going to be spraying all this paint around, I'm, I'm seeing in my mind's eye lots of venue managers' eyes glazing over going, we're going to be doing what? Was that a tough sell to actually get facilities to rent to you? Yeah, and it was an even tougher sell when we first started out because you got to imagine we were, what, 23, 24 years old, uh, just out of, you know, fresh out of college. Uh, so, yeah, when you go in and talk to, you know, these million dollar nightclubs and million dollar venues, and you're like, yeah, that's exactly what they say, Steve. They're like, you're going to do what? Um, but it just kind of, you know, it kind of, like everything in life, it just one thing builds off another. Uh, so we started in clubs. Uh, then we moved to arenas, uh, concert halls, and it just kind of like grew. So our reputation um, at the previous venues really helped us uh, get our start. And obviously now we have like a full on packet of, you know, what we're going to do from the time we come into the venue from the time we're going to leave. Um, so that, that kind of puts everyone's worries at ease. Okay, another lame question. When you have all this paint around, how do you clean that stuff up? It's one thing to clean up a few flyers in beer cups. It's another whole thing to paint a venue. Yeah, you know what's crazy? Like like I tell venues, 90% of that paint is, is, is walking out of the door. Um, so <laughs> it actually gets absorbed. I mean, you're going for the paint party, right? So it's, if you think about it, it's coming from top down. 
and it, the majority of it absorbs, you know, from the chest up. And then it just walks right out of the venue, and the rest of it we put down, you know, carp and carpet, uh, so that catches what's what's left over. Uh, this is awesome stuff. I talk a lot about thinking out of the box and thinking in new ways, and this one is just, this takes it to a new fucking level. This makes me sit there and think, whoop, wrong one. Uh, you know, we were sitting there wondering, are you freaking kidding me when I see all this stuff going on here? Um, let me ask you another more serious question. You mentioned that you had a couple partners, Sebastian and a couple others. I want you to tell me who they are. This idea of picking your partners is a huge part of doing something big in the music business. Talk about how you met your partners and, and, and how that little mix of different talents and experience comes together for Life in Color. Yeah, so when I first started doing the event, um, I was introduced through to uh, actually Sebastian's brother, David Solano, who's a DJ. He signed with William Morris, and you know he's, he was our resident for years. Uh, but I actually booked David, and I would book David on a on a frequent basis, and that's how I came to to know Sebastian. We kind of like instantly hit it off. He was you know somebody I spoke to often, and you know we would just talk for hours about business. And I remember Sebastian saying to me. You know, like, I want to take Deglo and turn it into the sensation of, of the U.S. And I kind of looked at him and was like, I think you're crazy, um, you know, but, but good luck with that. And um, we just stayed in touch over the years. I was, you know, continuous, you know, continuing to do my event. And um, I actually moved over to, to Europe. I, I moved to Spain. And I stayed in touch with Sebastian. They continued to operate, you know, the Deglo with the W. And uh, I... I spoke to him one day and I said, look, you know, like I'm thinking about bringing this over here to Europe. And he was like, look, you know, things are really taking off back here in the U.S. Like, Questions. you know, we need to all, all join up and, and come join the team. So I bought a flight home literally two weeks later. And yeah, the rest has kind of just been history. You, okay, one of the things that makes for great partnerships is when the partners add different elements into the mix. Um, you, you and I talked a little bit earlier, you don't get as much involved in the booking, the talent at these gigs as you are in more of the execution side. Is that a fair comment? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. th is, is Sebastian the guy that's involved booking the talent? Because that's kind of its own different headspace and requires a certain, you know, different kind of kooky mentality. Yeah, no, I mean, I, when we first started, uh, you know, booking talent, yeah, Sebastian would, would lead that. I mean, he was in touch with all the agents. Um, and then we, we naturally, as the company expanded um, and things became more streamlined, we brought in a talent buyer um, to assist with that. And now that we're with SFX, you know, it, actually in the room next door, Kevin Mitchell is here. He's our lead talent buyer for SFX. And we're talking about everything for 2015 and 16. So, yeah, it's kind of like... It, it did start at that point where we were doing it all ourselves and Sebastian would handle the bookings and then, you know, we, we, we put people in, in place to do that. Awesome. Yeah, here we got the phone ring. We got any questions over there, gentlemen? We have a couple of management questions. For okay, for Jake. Okay, we'll hold on to those. Men. All right, let me ask you another question here. Again, with my old kind of manager promoter hat on. In my world... It was all about the headliners, and the headliner came and did the show. They put on, the, uh, they they were there to play the songs that you wanted to hear, that that had brought you there in the first place. They spent a lot of money on sound and lights to kind of amplify that event. Today, more so than ever, I sit here wondering if in this whole EDM world, how much of the attraction is there the headlining talent versus the actual experience you're selling? I think it's even more highlighted in my mind when I think about. About a life and color event. Talk about that if you would. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's definitely a hot question right now um, throughout you know the whole industry. I mean, when we started, it was it was about the experience. Like I had told you earlier, you know, at some point we had even you know hip hop elements in the show. Uh, when when they started doing uh, spades, uh, the the terrace was ha uh, electronic music, and then the the bottom level was all house music. Um, sorry, hip hop. So. It, it, it started out as more of the experience, and I think to, to solidify the company and keep competition out, and obviously, you know, EDM was growing, uh, we started bringing in the elements of, of, of producers and DJs, and I, I think it, if, if, if where we're at today, it, it's absolutely necessary. A fan comes to these shows, like, you know, if I'm attending Tomorrow World or, or Mystery Land or EDC, like, you're, you're, 
you've grown to expect, you know, the top level talent. So um, I think we've in some ways contributed to that. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary today if you're going to, you know, compete with the, the big guys and, and, and draw the thousands out. All right, terrific. Uh, we got a question here uh, from our chat room. Audrey, you want to take that one there? Sure. This is from Panther Claw, and he asks, how do you think live performances and EDM music will change in the future? That's a great question there, Panther Claw. <laughs> well, I, I, I couldn't speak, you know, for everyone. I think there's a lot of different companies doing a lot of different things. I know I just spent a week out at Burning Man, um, you know, looking at all the different art cards and you know, kind of getting some creative juices. I, I wasn't the only one out there. I saw a lot of different, you know, industry people. I think, so I think everyone's trying to, you know, look to evolve. Um, I would say from the production element on our side, you know, we have this, this great medium paint and we're always looking to evolve that. So from our end, you know, it's like, how do we blast the paint out now? How do we make that experience more interactive? Um, and we've taken some pretty big steps here. We we started a company in 2000, I think it was 2010, uh, Advanced Concert Productions. And that was to, the whole goal with, with that was to actually bring the production in house. I mean, you look on the balance sheet, it's like, where's your money going? Well, it, it, it's going out in production. So let's bring that in house. So we hired um, some really intelligent people, put together a really great team. And, and now we can control that element here in house with, with R&D, with, trying things out and we have the equipment to you know kind of test the waters awesome uh we had another question there audrey for somebody talking about how to get started uh, or was it no this one was actually okay. a question from dj neil mack and he asked as entrepreneurs who want to build the future of edm by engaging youth like me to carry the industry through the future isn't the edm industry shooting itself in the foot by recent age restrictions for festivals ah there's another good question <laughs> You know, with life and color, it varies market to market. Um, I, I, I think it really does depend on the market. If you go to a, you know, a place like Miami, I mean, you're not going to get into the club if you're not 21 or you have a really good fake ID or you know somebody and you know, you're going to slip 100 bucks. Um, you go to a place like you know, Columbia, Missouri uh, or Kansas, it, it's probably more acceptable to be all ages. So I would redirect the question is well, where do you live um and uh it it, it kind of just depends on the market but me personally i think that um you know the event should be of a certain age limit um you know somewhere around 16 to 18 and up just because i mean there's a lot of legal ramifications that come with that um especially especially in the festival setting but you know going to see a, your favorite act in a live show i, I don't see the harm in being you know an all ages event Good stuff. All right, let me ask you another question. Um, we're talking about this idea uh, of partners and so forth. And uh, you guys uh, did a deal a while back um, with SFX. Anyway, SFX, for you folks, has got a gentleman by the name of Bob Sillerman, who's been buying a number of companies in the EDM space here, consolidating them. I want to know, you know, to the extent that having a great partner is important, they certainly bring a lot more financing, a lot more experience to the mix. How has that SFX partnership been working for you guys? Oh, it's been great. I mean, you know, Bob... He's obviously, you know, he's an innovator. He's done it before. Um, Steve, you and I have spoken about mm. this, but you know, he, he definitely knows what he's doing. But he, he's essentially bringing in some of the brightest minds and some of the best companies. And it's still, it's still really early. But so far, I have to say, it's been, you know, a pretty positive experience. I'm, I'm more excited about what's going to come in the next two years. I mean, you look at what happened uh, just last week, and they brought Tomorrow World to Brazil. And, you know, in three hours sold over 180,000 tickets. So, you know, when you start implementing brands like Life and Color with the guys down in Brazil and, and, and the European brands to South America and, and vice versa, it really kind of, it's, it's really exciting to see where we're going to take it and where it's going to go in the next, you know, five years because there's just a lot of, you know, amazing brands and smart people. And I think we're going to figure out a way to, uh, to implement those across the globe. Perfect. Let's talk about that thing. You brought up something very in, uh, in, uh, important there. If you're an artist 
and you're looking to build a live business, or if you're a concert promoter looking to build a live business. Too often, if you live here in America, one of the big countries, you think that's the whole world. But the truth of the matter is, it's a big world outside the United States, and that international market is developing around the world at a very fast pace, and it represents a huge source of income for artists. Talk about how you've taken this thing from Central Florida, doing parties, and now you're taking this thing around the world to places and doing huge, huge business yeah i mean it's it's kind of like it, when we we don't necessarily see that we're capped out in the united states not at all i mean we're doing um a festival here in miami that went from twelve thousand to twenty five thousand, and then now we're doing two days so um naturally as the business expand and we started hitting you know certain plateaus it's like well, well what's next and we looked internationally and I wouldn't say that we stumbled on it because we were we were really actively looking to get out of the U.S. But I I don't think we ever realized the potential that would go beyond our our domestic borders and it, and it's it's massive, Steve. It's like you know we we had our first event in Chile this past year. We did you know close to fifteen thousand people and um, in some of these countries and markets that you just you never would expect. So. I would say that we, we had every intention to be successful. How successful, we didn't realize it until we started getting into it and seeing how the, the, the markets and the fans reacted to the event. And, it, and their response has been you know, overwhelming. And it's, it's really positive to see that because, you know, and it's good for artists too, it's good for everybody because we can go to a guy like Jake and say, Jake, we have this wonderful platform. We have this event, which Krill has played several times. We can now plug you guys in anywhere in the world, essentially. Um, so there's a lot of positives that, that, that come with that outside of just the, the, the revenue. Yeah, I think the international business, a lesson I learned early on from, uh, from an old manager by the name of Doc McGee, who was managing Bon Jovi and Motley Crue at the time, and I was a young guy in the business about your age, and he told me, he goes, hey, Randy, that money everywhere else, it doesn't matter what it is, it turns into dollars, right? And I took that with me forever, and with my young friends in Incubus, we got them outside playing out of America before they ever did a gig in, Amer in, in the U.S. working for Sony Music, and it was a huge, huge... Uh, Hugely beneficial thing for all parties, including the fans around the world. Um, now, I, I see I'm watching on the website here, and, and, and uh, we're having some problems streaming. I think this YouTube streaming experiment, Cody, is just about over. Um, for all the might of Google, I wish they could figure out how to keep a connection going. We should uh, be good now, though, right? We should be good now. Yeah, we're gonna, yeah we'll be good next week, too. I don't uh, see the chat room. Yeah? Uh? The chat room's not live. Okay. Anyway, well, we apologize. Well, for if, if you're watching it right now, we'll post all of this up, an edited version online a little bit later today. Anyway, so you won't miss anything. All right, I Eric. Think Google blocked the, the Apple stream yesterday too. You know, uh, we've we've used a bunch of different ones, and we thought I've been a big fan of YouTube. Let me say that before they send some YouTube hit squad out for me, right? Uh, and they're there. We but we, for years we we uh, stream to UStream and LiveStream, who are are dedicated. Um, delivery systems. YouTube has come a long way, and, uh, and I admire their, their uh, enthusiasm, but I wish we could get a little more uh, execution behind that. Enough bitching about YouTube, okay? Um, Eric, you've been a serial entrepreneur since you were a kid. Uh, this comes pretty naturally. For lots of folks that are thinking about getting started, it's not quite as natural. Uh, before I let you go here, I'd like to ask you, what advice would you have for some, whether it's a young artist or a young music professional looking to do something big in the music business, what advice would you give them uh, based on your experience at this young age of yours? Um, I think the best advice I could give to somebody, you know, starting out young would be to, to really find your passion and find what, what makes you tick, what makes you wake up every morning because, um, you know, a job's a job, you, you know, you're going to go through the motions, but to, to really start your own business and, and put your money behind it and, and get it from, you know, from here to there, it's going to take a lot of hard work. And I think that's fueled by, by passion. I know, you know, like when, when we were coming out, my age group, when we were coming out of college, it was, you know, the market had just tanked. So it, it kind of made a lot of people just have to think and become innovative. So that would, that would be my biggest advice is, is really follow your passion. Um, 
come up with a plan, think it through, and, and then at the end of the day, it's just it's about execution and getting it done. And there, there's a fine line between uh, that success, and it's usually drawn by fear. Um, and you, you really have to like understand, accept your passion, and, and get over that fear and, and just go at it every day. That, folks, is unbelievably great advice. We talk about a lot of these things over the course of the year, these, these kind of big picture concepts that I've learned over the years. And you hit on one right there, Eric, which is that everybody has a certain level of fear, insecurity, and paranoia built into us as human beings. We, we, we joke about it, the FIP factor here in the office. And some people is higher than others. But if you're so afraid of losing, you'll never have a chance to win. So take the advice of one of my good buddies. You gotta love winning more than you love losing. Losing if you're going to do something great out there, and I would suggest you hang out with more smart people like Eric Fuller. Now, one final, I can't, I can't miss this opportunity. Um, we're supposed to play some golf one day. How's that as a networking tool, Mr. Fuller? Hey, I started playing golf when I was 15 years old, and I got, I consider myself to be a pretty well, like, popular guy in high school. And I had a lot of friends like, you know, why aren't you playing, you know, other sports, which I did, but I, I saw a lot of value in golf. I was 15, 16 years old playing golf with successful businessmen. And I used to ask them like all the time, like, what, what advice would you give a young guy in my age? And this is, you know, I'm 16 years old. And they'd always say, well, first don't get married. Um, so the, the, the second one they would say is, is don't get married. And then the third one would be, um, you know, really, really follow your passion. So that was something I actually learned uh, and, and took through golf. I thought, um, so yeah, it's, it's a great sport. I've met a lot of amazing people. I'm looking forward to, to getting my ass kicked by you, Steve. I hear you're quite the golfer, so I got a lot of work to do. I'll be happy to handle it. I thought your third answer was going to be, and if, you're, if your wife knows you play golf, convince her it takes nine hours to do it. Okay. Yeah. No, my, 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 my girlfriend knows it takes four and a half hours, so I've got, I've got you, about You five. fucked up there, Eric. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right, Eric, I want to thank you for joining us here today. I'm serious. When you're out here, we're going to go out and play a little golf. I hope you folks, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you missed it, come back and watch the replay a little bit later today. Great having you. And, and when you come to town, I want to come out to one of these Life in Color events. I want you to load me up with a hose and a paint can, all right? You got it, Steve. We'll, we'll have one with your name on it, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you the, which girl in the crowd to pick out, and we'll, uh, we'll get dirty out there. I know. I may, not, I may look old, but I don't, think, I don't think I'll have a problem spotting one, all right? No, uh, it'll be funny. Enjoy the, enjoy the interview with Jake. Tell him I all said right. hello, and thanks for everything. All right, you got it. Thank you very much. Take All care. right, that was Eric Fuller. Uh, God, you know, these promoters, they are having so much more fun than I had, Cody. Jeez, you know. Steve, we, the uh, audio is now back up. And the audio back live. So people can hear us. So this, yeah. is, this is not my Marcel Marceau. <laughs> Hi. Oh, you know, good. <laughs> Excellent. You know, we got all these tools. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in here. You know, we had the cable guy come here and wanted to start digging some cable this morning. Are you freaking kidding me? That's what I'm talking about. Ah! All right. Hey, folks, uh, before we bring our next guest in, I want to do a little shameless plug here. Um, one of the things that we've had on our shopping list for a very, very long time now is to get a mobile app where you can take the Renman MB learning with us everywhere you go. Um, and uh, we finally have made it happen here, I'm happy to report. Um, and let me show it to you. We got it. It's a, here's our little app. You can get it on iTunes, of course, if you're an iPhone user. We've got all our Renman Live shows, our Renman U lessons, uh, a lot of Ask Renman questions uh, that you've had. And more importantly, for you folks that are looking to get started, we've got countless stories of great people in the business, smart people people, artists and professionals, talking about how they get started. And we're going to add my next guest to that list in a, in a second here. All right. Enough of the shameless plugging here. Uh, my next guest is also uh, a bit of a serial entrepreneur in his own right. Uh, he's a partner in a music marketing and management firm called Third Brain. He's also the manager of two of the top EDM acts around today, uh, Cruella and Zoo. Uh, if that weren't enough, he clearly doesn't have enough to do, so he decided to start a web series for all you 20-something folks out there where he's hoping to inspire a new generation of entrepreneurs, and I think that is God's work myself. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I want to welcome you to my new friend, Mr. Jake Udell. There Thanks you go. Thanks for having me, Ray. Oh, there you go. Right. He likes my golf outfit. 
You know, I'm, gonna I'm ready to rock. <laughs> Can I tell a funny story here? Sure, bring it. Okay, so the first time Jake and I met, I invited her out to my, my favorite hang on the plan, which is Bel Air Country Club, right? And uh, it's a great club, but it's very long on tradition, right? And uh, so anyway, uh, we sent the email out as we do to everybody. Hey, make sure you wear a collared shirt, no jeans, you know, no cell phones, no laptops, none of that stuff. So apparently Jake didn't get the, the, the memo. I got the memo. Oh, you got the memo. You chose to define the memo. Okay. <laughs> He's a renegade. Anyway, we're sitting there having breakfast. So I'm waiting, and there's a guy named Coley. He's been working in the locker room for 20 years, and I know the look on his face when he comes out and he goes, Hey, uh, Mr. Rennie, uh, we got one of your friends here today. I said, uh, Okay, what's he wearing there, Coley? And he goes, Well, I, I think he's the first guy that wore leather pants to Bel Air <laughs> Country Club. And I said, I said, where do you have him? He said, I'm holding him in the locker room. So anyway, I set Jake up with a fine outfit, some Nike pants and a Nike shirt, which he didn't wear today. This is I thought much about cooler. wearing it, but I, I don't know. This is much cooler. Anyway, you. you're in your element. First of all, I want to thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having uh, me. It means a lot to me, you know, and there are lots of folks out there that are that are looking to connect and, and, and trying to get some inspiration. And guys like you um, are really a great example. So I appreciate you, you taking so much. the time. Um, I, I ask everybody, I've done a little homework on you, as you might imagine. Um, so I know a little bit of the story, but I'm going to ask you to tell it. Um, how did Jake Udell get started in the music business? Take as much time as you like, Jake. Um, I guess I really just wanted to have a voice. You know, I realized that we can spend our time, Rennie, as entrepreneurs mm -hmm. starting any kind of business, but um, I don't believe this world is necessarily measured by how much money you make, or, um, or anything except the impact that you're actually having on the world. And music was a vehicle by which I sort of realized the voice of musicians themselves, mm -hmm. the impact it has mm -hmm. is well beyond what I think the average person realizes it mm -hmm. is. Um, you mm -hmm. know, the amount of letters that we get um, from people struggling that are inspired by the artists that we represent or have represented over the years is really remarkable, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a part of that. Yeah. Now, but before that, you see, entrepreneurs don't just start. They, start. they show these signs earlier. I had a newspaper out. I had a golf club repair business. You started as kind of a jock sniffer, you know, <laughs> autograph chaser, right? That's okay. I say a that with great respect. Okay. All good. I say that with great respect. <laughs> I was too. Um, talk about your early days out sure. there hawking for signatures in the first yeah. big score, your first trip. Profit. I read that story. I wanted to cry. It was so good. Well, I very early on, I wanted to, when I was a kid, um, when I was really young, 10, 11 years in old. In Chicago, right? Yeah, I didn't need anything for the holidays. So when my family would say, what do you need? What do you want for the holidays? I would actually adopt a family and go and instead of getting gifts for myself, we'd go buy clothes and, and things for the needy. And when I was 13, I had this fascination with sports. And so instead of adopting a family that year, I actually decided to go to the local hobby store and buy some sports memorabilia to put up on my walls. You know, my dad was uh, always had me reading a lot of success books early on, but he also was a big baseball guy, so he had me reading the Cooperstown book. And I remember seeing Willie Mays the Catch and then going into the store and seeing that frame photo on the wall, and I said, I gotta have that. So um, my, my family bought it for me, and in January, I wanted more stuff, because that's what kids do. They want, 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 want. Sure. So I wanted more stuff, and my mom wouldn't take me back to the store because it wasn't the holidays anymore. So I went to the internet, and I bought a few things, and I realized I could get things for about a fifth of the price, maybe, that I could at the local hobby store. But what was really um, the moment, I guess, where my entrepreneurial spirit really kicked in was when I got one of the things in the mail, I believe it was like a Randy Moss signed 8x10, 8x10 photograph, and I put it back on eBay because I didn't like it, and it actually went for three times the price. And that was the moment at which I said to myself, I wasn't even trying, mm -hmm. maybe there's something really here. And then I started to, of course, as you mentioned, uh, chase the athletes themselves, so we, we were able to find out what, air, what, you know, what flights they took and what hotels they stayed at, and <laughs> there we were outside, all hours, all day, all night. Um, we were crazy, but um, we made some money, and mm -hmm. we learned really the values and values, and I guess hard work that it really takes yeah. 
to start a business. Yeah. And it wasn't just about being outside and getting the autographs. I mean, it was the whole process from selling the merchandise to shipping the merchandise to keeping in touch with the customer, really learning how to communicate. Mm. And anybody that knows me knows that I'm a huge believer in communication mm. intelligence. And I would say that's probably where I got my start, really yeah. meeting people on the internet and talking to strangers and just being able to communicate. And I'm sure all of those skills that you learn along the way uh, come in handy when you're in the music business. I want to talk about another great bit of a story that I saw. Um, you know, when I started this website, I wanted to inspire and, and mentor artists and young professionals to, 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 to go and do something. So one of my mottos was this idea of dream it and do it, right? And so a lot of people will wave that flag, dream it, do it, but it's, it's actually tougher there. The dreaming mm. part's pretty easy. The doing is a little bit tougher. And sometimes the dreams that we have in mind don't always work out. I dreamed of being a golf pro. This man here dreamed of being a rapper, right? Uh, my career as a golf pro didn't work out. I moved on. You're, talk about your career as a rapper and how that led to you to where you are today. You make it sound like it might have worked out, but it didn't. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to judge, only to chat, okay? But um, rapper, you know, I, I entrepreneur. Think as a rapper, you know, let's take it back a step further. As an entrepreneur, really, right? I mean, I've had probably 20 to 30 failed startups. I've had hundreds of failed ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's that process of doing that actually creates the necessary infrastructure of your brain to connect the dots in future situations and know what's gonna work. I mean, I spent my 10,000 hours mm -hmm. trying to market myself and other independent recording artists that didn't belong in the music industry as artists. So I had so much experience by the time my uh, moment really came to apply those skills to individuals like Corella or Zoo who are mm -hmm. more talented than myself, so um, as an artist. And so for me, um, that was a very interesting period of my life. It was full of new experiences, mm -hmm. you know, shifting my career from being in the sports industry to being fully drowned in the music industry. I mean, the second I went to music, I didn't care about sports at all anymore. I just want mm -hmm. to learn everything about music. And I think that I learned a lot about what not to do. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's really more than half the battle. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Again, I, I, I'm loving this conversation. You know, you fail much more than you win in life. I'd say that's probably particularly true in the music business, right? And so we talked about, Eric Fuller was talking about if you're afraid of failing, you, you can't get anywhere because failing often provides you some of your greatest lessons. Is that a fair comment? Yes, but to, to build on your point prior, I mean, I, as a, the type of person I am, I don't want to say that all my failures are behind me because they're not. I probably have mm -hmm. more ahead of me than behind me. I'm going to go on a limb and say you yeah. got a few ahead of you too. Definitely, but I don't want to think that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to believe that. I want to be the entrepreneur. Over the past three years, everything that I've wanted to see happen has happened and then mm -hmm. some. Mm -hmm. And we've had failures along mm -hmm. the way, but they've been minor blips on the yeah. radar to the success that we dreamed. And as an entrepreneur, it's really motivating to think that we can dream up in the sky Mm -hmm. And the, there's always that saying about shooting for mm -hmm. the moon and ending mm -hmm. up amongst the stars. Mm -hmm. But what if you shoot for the moon and you go past it? And I've mm -hmm. been so blessed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I really wind up on your show today mm -hmm. to meet so many amazing people and, and work with so many amazing people that have helped me get to this point where I actually feel in, in control of this success for mm -hmm. the first, one of the first times really yeah. in my life. <clears throat> it can be fleeting, but I think you've got a great, you, you've got a great attitude about it because you know, you, you got to shoot high. Of course. Um, it's there, there aren't perfect answers out there that we, you, you talked about the little failures. My advice to people out there is that, you know, you're going to make some mistakes. The key is, is not to have any show stoppers, career killers, you know, in the golfing parlance, it's hitting it somewhere where you can hit another shot, keeping it playable as you were. So for all you folks, are out there think it has to be perfect it clearly doesn't the most important thing i think is you got to keep showing up and swinging the bat uh, showing up your, and following up is really exactly that's what it takes um i want to talk a bit uh, wait any questions here feel free to jump in audrey because i'm like deep down in it so i'm not paying yeah, sure. attention i have a pretty general question but maybe sure. you can give us some advice um silver rain asks what's a good way to get started in the edm world well i'd love to know which aspect of the business he wants to get started in because every aspect is different, but I guess it's about 
Like, take, take it, it from the artist's perspective, I guess. You think it's an artist? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think they need to do whatever they can to learn and really get into the business. And I guess that's sort of the chicken and the egg problem sometimes. But with that being said, there has to be a way um, for them in their local town or via the internet to get involved, whether that means with a blog or with a promoter like Eric Fuller mm -hmm. or um, with other artists online. You know, there's, there's record labels and young companies out there like Monster Cat that have not only a full-fledged networking community of artists, but also of fans and the fans and artists networking together. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to be involved somehow in some way and the EDM world is one of the first times where there's obviously that fascination with the industry, but it's also, what I mean by that is fascination with the actual industry side of the business as opposed to just with the artists themselves. But I also think that it's one of the first times where you actually have so many doors that are accessible to you as just a person sitting at home who may want to make music and can for the first time from his bedroom or can join a blog without ever having met the person that runs the blog. And um, that's really what makes the, the era that we live in super special. And, um, and I, would say, I would say reading is obviously, too, very important. You've got you to know the history otherwise, not just of dance music, but just of the music industry in general and of the necessary success principles that it takes to really achieve um, the level of success that Silver Rain probably is aspiring to achieve. All right, good and question. We got somebody on the phone over here. Sure. Do you know that, Code? We sure do. Okay, I can't hear you, Code. <laughs> on the megaphone. Hey. Okay, who do we have on the phone with us here? Hey, it's uh, Matt from Minnesota. Matt from Minnesota. You're on with uh, Mr. Jake Udell. What's up, Matt? I'm not allowed to turn around. So. You can turn around, <laughs> but he's not. I told him he's not really there, but you can. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Sorry, Matt. What's your question, my friend? Well, first I want to say thanks for having me on the show, guys. Uh, it's really awesome what you guys are doing here. And uh, Jake, I want to extend my congratulations to you. All the success you've seen for all. It's a really awesome project. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, absolutely, man. Um, what I'm really interested in learning, though, is in Corolla's early years, what were some of the actions that you took to bring it through those initial levels of success? And in answering, I'm really hoping for something outside of, you know, those, those fluffy bros work like, Oh, networking, writing a great song, social media. Like, All the shit I just talked about, Matt? Awesome. Come on, man. You're killing me here. <laughs> dude, dude, I actually, uh, well, you know, and those, those are all very, very important, Steve, but, yeah, to, to hey, help, help me out here, Jay. Sure. Sure, Matt. Well, Good question. there's plenty of cookie cutter advice on the internet, so I won't give you that. But I think um, it's really important to mention that when I started with Corella almost three years ago now, they had already been in development for another four to five years. And that was under one of my business partners, Nathan Lim, who really took the necessary steps, in my opinion, to get them as a band ready for the big stages. And some of those necessary steps included everything from making sure they were in the studio every day to actually running and singing in place throughout an entire summer um, to get them actually physically fit to do what they do today as the only real, um, I don't wanna say the only live performers in dance music, but you know one of the only live performers in dance music. And so um, I think that that incubation period is really important to think about who, and I don't know if it's for you as an artist or for one of your artists, but um, who the artist actually aspires to be and who they aspire to be not just today, but also 10 years from now. I talk about longevity a lot. And I think it's very important that artists are conscientious, conscientious of their longevity, but they also have to be authentic. And it's very difficult to be conscientious and authentic at the same time. It's a, it's a fine balance for an artist. So um, I think that the artist has to go through um, that process. And it takes a lot of, I mean, I would say Corella's hundreds of failed demos. So if you don't, or your artist doesn't have hundreds of failed demos or thousands of failed demos, I think it's really difficult. You know, one of my favorite artists, or my favorite artist, Kanye West, he talks about in the college dropout, three beats a day all summer. How many other producers in the world were making three beats a day all summer, this summer that Kanye West, um, you know, started to achieve his success? So I think it's really about putting in that time and, you know, between 
failed records and failed music videos and failed, you know, record label meetings and this and that, you actually start to get realer, uh, realer bonds with the people that are achieving success or will be potentially able to achieve success with you. So I think that it's about figuring out who those people are for your career. And that takes time. And I think that Corella took the necessary time. So that by the time I did come into the picture, from a marketing perspective, they already knew who they wanted to be. And they were so certain of it that it was very easy to communicate that vision to the rest of the world. That's some good stuff. Matt, are you an artist or a professional? Uh, I'm an artist. Okay. And I don't want to say it was easy, but we were, we were able to do it. Because it wasn't easy. I mean, it was never, this was never easy. But we, we felt like we had our backs against the wall and we wanted to do whatever it took because we believed in them so much. I mean, I didn't even know anything about dance music. I got, I'm getting called the, the EDM guy or EDM this all over the place. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I just see stars and I believe in them and I want to make sure that their vision is brought to fruition. I mean, that's what I do. Those are some great advice for all you artists out there. Matt, that wasn't exactly cookie cutter stuff, was it? Not at all. Not no. at all. Thanks, Jake. No, Thanks, and, and, and for the folks Thanks, out there that are watching, I was literally taking some notes here. This is good stuff, Jake. You should start your own show. Oh, we're going to talk about that <laughs> later. Um, going in the studio every day, showing up, practicing. Fuck, imagine that, huh? Um, actually getting yourself physically prepared to do live shows. It seems easy enough, but no fun watching your singer's tongue hanging out of their face. Uh, hundreds of failed demos. Not like, hey, I wrote two songs you know, a month ago, and they're great, man. How many did you write today? Oh, those last two are great. Wrong, okay. And more importantly, great careers, as opposed to great moments in the sun, take time. Whether you're an artist or a professional, if you're a professional, it takes time to build relationships. It takes time to get good. You no don't want to put in doing. that time. And you gotta love it. Yeah. You gotta love it. So great stuff there. Matt, did that answer your question? Yes. Thanks again. How's the weather in Minneapolis today? <laughs> it's it's god awful. It's raining and it's windy. I'm hey, Midwest Cug, guy. Do we know? Do we know any other Minnesota dudes in the house here? I'm a proud Minnesotan from Blyzetta, Minnesota. <laughs> 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 Blyzetta. Nobody knows where Blyzetta. Do you know where Blyzetta is? Where is that place? Blyzetta. <laughs> <laughs> Wyzetta for the wise guy. All right, Matt, thanks a lot. Go take a trip up to Wyzetta. They're pretty soon they're going to have a sign up there, the home of Cody the... Trojan Man. All right, there you go. All right, okay, we're not above a shameless gag. Thanks for calling, Matt. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> okay, um, Actually, my friend was messaging me on Facebook the other night about Zoo and how much they loved him. This is just a nice transition into Zoo. This is just flowing so nicely. Go ahead. Yeah, Sorry, Aj. And I know that there's not too much music released, and I was just wondering, is there a strategy behind that? Because I was tempted to tell him, you know, they're just building up the buzz and, and making people want more, so... Just let us know a little bit more about Zoo and what you plan to do with them. Well, specifically to the release strategy, um, Zoo is the number one artist in the world when it comes to upholding a certain elegance and, and appreciation for quality. And so music doesn't get rolled out per a typical artist, manager, record label, strategic conversation. It actually gets rolled out when it's not only ready, in his opinion, as an actual recording, but also to be heard by the world. And I think that's really important because a couple years ago, and I think still today, a lot of people are, the world is moving so fast that I think from a release strategy perspective, um, I've talked about this with some of the biggest executives in the industry, they think that you still have to like release something every week when you're in campaign mode or every couple days um, to actually succeed and for a record or a album to reach its full potential. But from my company's perspective, from Zoo's perspective, it's actually not about that at all. It's just about creating really, really high quality art that is going to move your friend enough to even ask the question in the first place. So. You had an interesting comment along that because I've been, we were listening to Zoo in the office here yesterday. And in this EDM banner has gotten, yeah. the umbrella of EDM has gotten very wide. Right. When I listen to that song, I listen to Fade, I listen to a bunch of stuff on Spotify and a bunch of mixes. That didn't hit me as EDM in, in, in a typical sense. It was very vibey, you know, moody. 
music with great vocal twists, and those are elements of great songs, great vocal hooks, great musical backdrop. Is Zoo an EDM act? Am I missing something? Am I just too freaking old I mean, to get let's, it? I mean, let's take it back to what I said before, Rennie. It's very difficult because I have, you know, um, uh, some big acts in the space, but is Zoo an EDM act? Is, am I an EDM guy? I mean, I don't mm. consider myself an EDM guy. Um, when I first heard Cruella for the first time, and keep in mind, I heard about dubstep two years prior, and mm -hmm. I hated it. And when I heard Cruella, I said, um, I actually thought it sounded like farts. I mean, it's just horrible. And, and um, who didn't, right? Yeah. And um, when I heard Cruella for the first time, I said, wow, well, what genre is this? Mm -hmm. And when I was told it was dubstep, that's when I really knew there was something special. Mm -hmm. um, I always knew there was something special about them, but that, that's the first time there was something special about the actual recordings themselves, the songs. Because if I didn't like dubstep, but I liked Cruella, and Cruella was making dubstep, at the time. Mm -hmm. There would be a lot of people out there, in my opinion, that may also be interested in them. And so when I heard Zoo for the first time, I actually, I didn't even know what genre it was. And somebody mm -hmm. said Deep House. We've, you know, we've heard everything from indie dance to whatever, dance. What, but I said, what genre is this? And when someone said that to me, I said, what I don't necessarily, um, my personal taste has never, it's evolving, of course, always, every day, just like anybody else's. But at the time, my focus wasn't on Deep House. Yeah. So I said, this is Deep House? And then I said, who's singing? Well, great performances, great singers, yeah. and great songs transcend genre, genre. right? Yeah. So when, you know, uh, Avicii, when everybody, was, he's an EDM act, he's not an EDM act. That song that, that got him to this level that he's at right now, Great vocal performance, Hello, touching Black's lyrics, amazing. right? Great singer. Yeah. And the EDM part of it for me, that de 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 is kind of more like gravy without mm. the steak. You put the gravy, it's not a meal, right? And so I think that I see that more and more happening. And I, I don't know if that's because the EDM world now is becoming big enough that it's that these classic elements that have worked for thousands of yeah. years are starting to reappear in, and you mentioned your Cruella folks who actually go out and sing live. We're bringing the rock to the rave. Unbelievable, whereas I sat here with Derek Vincent Smith and I said, you know, I'm not sure I'm getting it because of the performance part of me, I want to think that something can happen. So right. some guy going, boom, and doing this feels like it, the right? USC cheerleading squad rather than a performer, right? And Cruella, they yeah. go out there, if they're off I mean, singing one night, you're gonna hear it, you're gonna feel it, and that's okay, because it's real. I wanna touch on three of your points. The first is the Avicii record. I remember two years ago being at Summit Series in Utah and Aloe Black performing with about 30 of us in the room. And you knew he always had it in him. And that song actually has not only transcended genre, it's also um, transcended the term itself, EDM, mm -hmm. because it's the most spotify record of all time. Um, and that really says something about where we stand as a community. As far as Zoo being dance music, you know, Zoo's just making music. I mean, he, this EP for him was about making a certain type of dance music that could be played in the bedroom or in the car in very intimate spaces. And all the artwork surrounding it that he's created has been um, about that. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because despite the fact that he doesn't consider himself a dance music artist, you have Tiesto going out playing the record and he's been an incredible endorser as Tiesto always is for, for um, as a leader and pioneer of our community. You have Diplo putting it on his approved SoundCloud. You have Skrillex tweeting about it. You have Pete Tong, who was the original guy that debuted this record. You have Calvin and Deadmau5 trying to sign it. All these things are happening in the dance music community Yet, is Zoo really even a dance music artist? And I think that's what makes it special. When you ask the last question mm -hmm. to Eric Fuller, what's gonna push the live performance forward? I think it's gonna be performers like Cruella, performers like Zoo, that actually are creating. I mean, I had from here to rehearsals for his live setup because he actually wants to take a live setup further, which, you know, will be rolled out as people will see sooner than later. So it's really fascinating, you know, what EDM artists have rehearsals. Uh, it's an interesting point. I won't tell it. Because they want to put in that time and, you yeah. know. Well, again, it's a, di it's a little bit different frame. One of the other things that was striking for me about Zoo is that 
A, you know, not putting out a ton of stuff. He's putting out great stuff. Great stuff lasts longer than a ton of shit. Crack music. Period. Okay. Crack music. Um, what was when striking to me was is there's a sense of mystery about Zoo, which I think is important in a world where because of social media stuff, they can consume you and eat you up and mm. spit you out and be bored by the end of the day. He's got great visuals. The video to Faded is sexy. It feels kind of insidiously like I'm doing some bad things and enjoying it. Were you at the club that night? <clears throat> oh, God, I wish I was, though. God damn. Who put that visual together? Is, that, is he part of that process, too? He is not only a part of it, you may not have known this, he actually directed the video. I did not know that. Yeah, he actually directed and edited the video himself. Um, we were playing around with a lot of different visual aesthetics and we came across inspiration that really, to us, when we saw that black and white style of you know, nightlife culture, we, didn't, we couldn't find anywhere in the United States, in New York or Los Angeles, that we felt properly identified with who Zoo was because in the US it's either like you're the bottle service club or you're you know at the grungy club and it's like uh, what Dim Mock Tuesday was. So mm. I think that we don't have that in between and France is an area where even their grungiest or, um, or most greedy nightlife actually is still perceived with a certain sense of fashion and luxury and so we decided to shoot it in France and um, when we got the footage back we really felt like we were capturing that aura and that feeling. And it was important to us to capture it because the record deserves that visual. The record is just such, a, yeah. such an incredible and record. And that's it, because when you're out there as an artist and you're trying to paint a picture of who you are, yeah. part of it is the music, of course. Without that, you're nothing. But the artist that can, that can, in today's world, that can put the great visuals that takes a song that you're hearing in your head or hearing on the radio, and then when you see a visual takes it up a notch, that's when you're getting right. Cody, do we have somebody on the phone over there? We do not. Audrey, if you've got any great questions, while you're looking for some good questions, I want to ask you about one. We're going to go back into learning mode here, folks. Take your pencils out. Everybody wants to know, how do I find a manager? Okay, Ooh. It's been my experience that more often than not, the great managers find you. My question to you is, how did you hook up with Cruella and Zoo? You, which order you go in? <clears throat> Cruella... Um Chris Trindle, who's the producer in the group, Rain Man, he actually, when my mixtape was hosted by DJ Khaled and DJ Drama three years ago as a rapper, not three years ago, five years ago as a rapper, um, he sought me out to put beats on my mixtape. And at the time, um, I didn't necessarily believe in Chris or the product, um, the music really, right? So um, it was a year later when my producer, who was really close friends with R. Kelly and had at the time, um, one year prior, actually told Chris that you know he wasn't ready and he thought it was as bad as I did. He hired Chris. And that was the moment I said, what? He hired Chris. So I, I listened to the music again and I was, I was dumbfounded and I called Chris and I said, what have you been doing for the past year? And he said, I've been in my grandmother's basement getting just better. making music, getting better. And that was the moment at which I knew he had something. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until years later I knew Corella had something, but I was always about marketing. I've never thought about the way we market artists or the way we market music. I've thought, how do we actually market this vision? How do we affect culture? And that doesn't just apply to music. And when you don't think in terms of how do you market music and you don't think about what premiere, what remix, what this, what that, in a cookie cutter format, as our boy Matt talked about earlier in the question, I think that's when you actually reach some of the greatest solutions in how do we bring this music to the world in the most creative way. And so I was already doing that. So Corella was interested in me for that. I was interested in Corella because they could write and produce my music, which luckily is not released and is never going to be released. Um, I'm going to go find it, man. You can't. It's not, you. Okay. That's not out there. I stopped, I stopped releasing stuff okay. um, you know, a few years ago. So, But um, at, that, at that time, we were kind of ha building a working relationship from... Uh, you know, marketing and advice, and eventually that relationship evolved into a management capacity. Mm -hmm. So I think that the advice out there, though, for young aspiring artists looking to find managers, young managers looking to get the attention of other managers mm -hmm. who can make things happen for their artists, it goes back to what really the theme of today's show has become, which is release great music or have great content. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody can come in here and sit right where Audrey's sitting, and pitch you and I, and despite our generation gap, mm. we both get it, which mm. we both get mm. Zoo. So mm. that's kind of 
evidence that it's possible. Mm -hmm. That's when I think you know you really have something, and that's mm -hmm. how to attract the great managers. Yeah. It's interesting the comment there because you know, looking at both of us, you you would clearly fit more of the culture than me, and, and perhaps that's why you were a little out of my culture over at the club here, right? But it's music. If it's great music, all that other stuff goes away. It's just about a great song and a great performance. You got a question over there, Audrey? Yeah, it's actually a question for myself sure. as a young manager. Okay, well. we have Audrey who would like <laughs> to ask a question here. Yeah, no, I just wanted to know from your perspective, right now you have these two clients that you're working with, and I just wanted to know, is it better to have... Move over this way a little bit, Audrey, so we can get you in the shot sure. here. There you is go. It, Come on over. <laughs> is it better to have fewer clients and really put in all of your energy into those? Or do you think there's like a magic number of clients to have? I'm just wondering, I mean, Steve has had one client his entire career. I had a bunch at one time in a previous incarnation that might've informed my, my second career as a manager. Right, but just from your perspective, what do you, what do you think is well, the right way to go? Um, I think times are changing. Um, Steve, you said to me at one point mm. that management is, you know, a really almost thankless job. It's it's very difficult. It can be very. Yeah, thankless. a lot of, a lot of music industry positions can be very thankless, and I guess I feel blessed that to work with clients that respect me and believe in my ability to support them in executing their vision and. Because of that, we haven't been limited to just two clients. Um, we've been able, I think it's important for the clients themselves of the company that the company is growing health, um, very healthy and because there's more opportunities that are coming into the company itself that actually enables us to become more networked. So I have other clients, you know, those are two that we're talking about today, but um, I have other clients like Pegboard Nerds who's playing at Avalon this Friday. Shameless plug. And we but, had somebody who asked a question about them, so they are making some noise. Go ahead, sorry for yeah, that. Yeah, so um, I, want, I will grow my company as fast as I can provide the infrastructure to do so as long as I'm bringing on artists, managers, like it actually, it boils down to the employees themselves of the company right. are in a position where mentally they are ready to affect culture and they're willing to do whatever it takes to do that and to actually get this vision across that they may have that we believe will affect culture. I keep going back to that affecting because so it's that's that's what we do it for. Well, that's right? what it's funny because we you know you were a lot younger than me, but but you hit so many of the the, the things that make it gratifying and not thankless. Those notes from people where they heard a song or saw a performance, and it was so much more than that for them, right? Where it had an impact on their life. I've told the story a million times of being a 16-year-old, sitting at seven buddies of mine at the Forum here in L.A. in 1972 for a matinee show of the Rolling Stones, and it literally changed my freaking life. It was just like, holy shit! What is that all about, right? And I so was negative 17 and I was already banging on the womb. <laughs> yeah, jamming but it's, up. that's the power of music. It, it, it actually has much more weight than perhaps it deserves, but it becomes a release. It's mm. our way to, to deal uh, with you know, some of the, the trickier parts of living. Um, so let me change gears here now. We're running late as usual here. That's I don't okay. know. You, okay, but, okay. Uh, I started this show about two years ago, and the way we got introduced here, I didn't say it at the top, was um, Eric Fuller, who I'd met from my friend, Neil Jacobson, who I know you know as well. Who doesn't know Neil? Is he a freaking networking animal Guy's or amazing. what? Okay. Um, anyway, Eric, he'd become a fan of the show and so forth. And during the summer, we had a little lull in the action. And he goes, I hope we're going to keep doing shows here, man. And, uh, and I said, yeah, we are. We're just working on some other stuff. And he said, well, you should meet this guy, Jake Udell, because he's got a show on the, on, on the Internet, on YouTube, that you'd appreciate, Randy. It's a little bit different audience, but a similar kind of thought. Tell us about your, your web series called 20-something, what it's all about, what you're looking to do with it. Well, I started, um, I happened to meet one of my mentors, a guy by the name of Tim Sanders, about a year and a half ago now. Um, I was in Oliver uh, from the audience's office, and I happened to meet Tim, and I had already read his book, Love is the Killer App, which I advise everybody goes out there and, and buys. Um, it's an amazing book that changed my career as an entrepreneur. And when I met Tim, we, we hung out, and... The first time I hung out with him, he actually said, can I, can I interview you? And I said, yes, when? And he says, right now. And he pulls out. He didn't even have his phone. He had one of those old school recorders, and he pulls it out. 
and he recorded our entire conversation. After about 10 minutes, he, he felt inspired, I guess. And I was inspired as well, obviously, because I was meeting one of my mentors. So um, he wound up taking that and getting it translated on the internet. And he sent it back to me, and he said, you should write a book. And I had always, you know, I'd read 100 books prior to that point in my life, and I, at least 100, um, you know, real, even when school I was reading on the side for, because I liked to, when I was told to read one book at school, I was reading another book um, because I just wanted to. And so I, at that point, had already come to the conclusion that at some point in my young career, I didn't know if it was gonna be in my 20s or my 30s, I wanted to write a book that was the success principles basically for young people. And what that's become now is my vision to actually redefine the word entrepreneur. When you look up the word mm -hmm. entrepreneur in the dictionary, it talks about starting a business. But that has a, a big burden on young people because that's a very difficult thing to do. But today, you don't have to start a business to be an entrepreneur. You just have to think like one. Yeah. And so 20-something became the working title of the book. But I couldn't wait until the book actually comes out probably in 2016 or 17. I couldn't wait till then to start educating because I was so passionate about it. And it wasn't just my passion. Other people, you know, like yourself, are mm. passionate about it as well. So we created the web series 20-something to bring other like-minded people on the show. They didn't have to be in their 20s. Most of them are. You're going to um, have me on the show here? I'm going to have that's you on three, the show, That's Renny. almost 320. Renny, I don't right know there. if you can go from your show to my show. <laughs> oh, we can't. My show's like you. a bootleg version of your show. All right, well, I'm going to help you. We'll, we'll, we'll sort that out. Yeah, so we just have young people on the show that talk to us about what they're doing in all different fields of the industry. Well, what's fun about it is, is that, you know, a couple of days, the notion of writing a book, that's how this show of mine started. You know, Brandon Boyd once goes, hey, you know, you should start, you should write a book. You got so many great stories. And for years, I've been like the rabbi of rock. People go, hey, Renny, can I, get, can I pick your brain on something, right? But the truth of the matter is, I have a tough time writing the show script here, much less a book. But the learning part of it um, is important. So that's how our show started. Same thing. It was just, it was just an easier way to get the, the word out there. And then, of course, the manager and show biz guy and me started, you know, up in the ante and putting in my own kind of heavy metal stuff. Uh, you know, you got a phone call there, Code? Oh, that's our regular phone line. Um, it's good stuff here. I mean, I think it's really important to be out there inspiring people to do something because for most folks, I don't think it comes as naturally as for you. And I totally agree with your comment that it's not so much about starting a business. There are people that have an entrepreneurial spirit that are willing to look at things in a new way, that are willing with some respect to, to take a look at the things that have worked in the past, but skeptical and, and suspicious about whether they work t today. And so, so many of the things that you guys are doing and Eric are pieces of it are things that work for me, but very clearly you guys have a different attitude on some of those fundamentals. And I think that's the great takeaway for all you people that are out there that are looking to do something great. There's a lot to be learned from people that have been doing it for a long time. And I'm here to tell you that one of the greatest benefits of doing this web show is for me to sit with people like yourself and Eric Fuller and be able to pick your brains because the truth of the matter is it doesn't matter whether you're 25 or 59. Um, the day you stop learning is your first step into that freaking box. And I'm going to try to hold off on that one as long as possible. Uh, we have any questions or phone calls, Code? Audrey, any final questions before we let Jake go back to making some money here instead of yapping with me all morning? Yeah, just to touch back to the book <clears throat> comment. I just finished reading The Operator about David Amazing. Geffen. Amazing book. So um, I'm going to read Love is the Killer app, but can you give us a few other suggestions for people looking to learn? Because I think yeah, reading of course. books are, is like one of the most important things. Um, there's a few that are absolute. I mean, there's, there's hundreds that are must-reads, but um, ones that have been really important to me, uh, my Bible, is The Essence of Success by Earl Nightingale. Okay. It's probably the best book ever written that is not currently still in print. Um, it's, it's an amazing story. There's a book called Triggers by one of my mentors, Joe Sugarman, who started Blue Blockers. That is an incredible book to get you thinking outside the box about, about marketing and, and marketing concepts. Um, if you like the David Geffen book, there's a book called When I Stop Talking, You'll Know I'm Dead. I which heard is about that the one. Jerry Weintraub Jerry story. Jerry Weintraub. I used right. to caddy for Jerry at Hillcrest Country Club. No way. Not a very, not a good golfer at all. You know, he's not you call like you, Chopper. Oh no, he looked like he was chopping wood. He looked like he didn't. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was horrible. You know, Jer yeah. Jerry's story is incredible and, and beyond um, inspiring. And I think that for people that want to be in the music business, obviously the classic "All You All You Need to Know About right. the Music Business" by yeah. Donald Passman is is a must. 
This is going to be the new classic, folks, right here, Renman MB. I'll throw one uh, piece of reading on that one for you. And I'm not kidding, folks. There's a book by the guy by the name of Dr. Bob Rattelli, who's a sports psychologist, wrote a book called Golf is Not a Game of Perfect. And I've actually sent this book around to a mm. number of people. The most recently, I gave it to uh, Nate Roos. I said, Nate, I want you to read this book here. But everywhere you see golf, I want you to put in music business or life. Life's not a game of perfect. Music business isn't game of perfect. And it's all about trying trying to figure out where you want to go and trying to avoid those showstoppers and those career killers. Uh, it's been great having you on here. Before I go, I want to talk about a couple things before we get out of here. Have you ever heard of a, a website called Sounds From A Room? I haven't. Uh, there's a great little place. It's called Sounds From A Room. It was a website that was started over in England, right? And they do these little bedroom concerts, very intimate concerts in real mm -hmm. people's house. And they go and send, you know, send a note out to the, the members. And so 60, 70, 80 people will turn up at an undisclosed location to it. see three or four acts that they don't even know who are playing until you actually get there. A great little thing that I was put on to. I'm going to get a chance to go to my second one this weekend, and I'm looking forward to it in a big way. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to some of the sounds from a room people, and, and they can tell their own story, but something that's really terrific. Um, today, Jake is 25 years old, just starting off on what I reckon will be a great career in the music business. Next week we're going to be talking, whoop, wrong hat, Rocky. Uh, give me Richard, uh, Richard there. You got him there? Richard Goddard? Yeah. Uh, there he is, right there. Richard Goddard, if I said you folks out there, how about, could you, how would you feel about having a 50 year career in the music business that included writing number one singles, that included being partners in one of the story label Sire Record, that included producing records for the likes of the Go-Go number one albums, and then topping it all off by starting a very digital, or very, you know, 2014 version of a digital distribution house called Orchard. Well, that's my, my guest, Richard Goddard. Uh, back to, I keep pulling that one up. Get Richard back on there. Anyway, he's going to be joining us next week. And it's what we were talking about. There's great lessons to be learned from people that are around, sitting around and have been doing this for a very long time. They've dealt with the whole evolution of the business. Uh, and Richard is, is one of these great forward thinkers who could have laid it all down, phoned it in and said, I'm mm. done. But he's not. He still thinks about what works today and should be a great one for all you folks um, to, to be a part of. And it will demonstrate once again this whole whole kind of cross-generational exchange of information and ideas and inspiration about how to do something great in your life. So anyway, I want to thank you for joining us today here, Jake. Audrey, Thanks, I want to thank Jenny. you for showing thank up you. again. I want to thank our crew back here. I want to thank our friends at YouTube. <laughs> You need a little work on the platform, okay? Uh, my name is Steve Rennie. I am the Red Man. We'll see you on September 24th. I am out of here. See ya.